to our MTEC MRC final jury. I'm Edith Ardne, MTEC director, and I'm joined by Michael Weinstock, founding director of MTEC, and our staff, Milad, Alijan, Eliana, Abinav, and Lorenzo. Welcome, everyone. Uh, before we start, I would just like to ask once again, for those of you who are watching, if you could please mute yourselves during the jury so that we have a good sound quality. Uh, we are here live on Zoom and also live on AA's YouTube channel, and so welcome everyone there as well. Um, as you know, these have been very challenging times. Uh, we've been working completely online uh, since March 23rd. And um, first of all, I guess we'd like to thank all of our students for pulling through these difficult times and for all of their efforts and, and dedication. Um, Mike, would you like to say a few things perhaps before I start to introduce the jury? Uh, a few things perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's been a tough time and I've been very impressed with uh, how the students have coped and how the teaching staff have too. It's been a strange new world for everyone, um, but I think the work is very good, and uh, I hope everyone enjoys that today. Okay, um, I would like to make a short introduction to our jury. First of all, we'd like to thank them for being here with us today. And after I make the introduction, if they could perhaps say a few words about themselves, that would be great before we, we begin. Uh, so this, after, this morning, we are joined by Irene Gallo, who is a partner at Foster and Partners, and she is the head of the SMG uh, at Foster. Hi, Irene. Hello, good morning. Very excited to be with you this morning. Um, I started at AA few years back, I don't want to count how many. I did the environmental design course, don't know what the name is now, Energy and NCD. NCD. And, um, and now at Foster's I'm leading the specialist modeling group, which is a, an internal, an, a, whatever, within Foster's an R&D group focusing on complex geometry issues and building physics. Um, it's around 20 people, and uh, we are doing consultancy on projects, but also we run our own internal projects just with, uh, within SMG, which I think is very, very exciting because when you combine uh, the ability of people to generate wonderful geometries and solve complex issues together with building physics, and when I say building physics is everything that has to do with light, sound, wind, and thermal issues, when you combine the two, wonderful things happen. And, and the internal projects we run are very, very successful within the office um, the last few years. Thank you. Thank you, Irene. Um, great to see you. Um, we are also joined by Axel Kerner, who is a research associate at ITK Stuttgart. He's also an ex MTECher. So welcome, Axel. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the invitation. Um, yeah, there's not much more to say than what you said. <laughs> Come on, I'm sure there is. <laughs> uh, I studied also at the AM Tech um, um, seven years ago, and since six years I've been a um, research associate um, and now tenured lecturer at the ITKE at the University of Stuttgart, where I'm also involved in teaching and coordinating the ITEC master program. Thank you. Thank you, Axel. And are we joined by Andre yet? Or no, not yet. Well, I'll just not say yet, a few no. things. I'll I'll say a few things about Andre and then as soon as he joins, we can start. So Andre Martin will be joining us shortly. Um, he's a partner at PLP Architecture in London, and he's also a senior lecturer at the University of Westminster. He has been joining us for the past several years to our MTech juries. Um, and so we look forward to having him with us very shortly. And uh, yeah, I'd like to just ask uh, our team. So we have four teams that are going to present today. And you guys have 15 minutes, as you know. So 15 minutes presentation that will be followed by our jury comments. Um, and that's how we will 
round, round the jury. I also like to, uh, for those of you who might not know, uh, who might not be informed that at 2.30 this afternoon, we are going to hold our annual keynote lecture uh, where we will be joined by Dr. Mike Cook, uh, the former chairman of Bureau Heppold Engineering. And uh, he has been working, uh, let's say, collaborating with MTech for the past 20 years or so. He has been our external examiner as well. So we have, we have a very kind of uh, deep and long lasting relationship with him. So uh, we look forward to having everyone there and uh, you can register on the AA website uh, for his lecture uh, through Eventbrite. Yes, uh, and now I'm just going to wait for Andre to come in. Uh, we are going to start with our first team. Are you guys ready? Yes, we are ready. Perfect. Okay, you can share your screen. Okay. Of course you are. Don't forget to introduce yourself, guys. Sure. Okay, you can see the screen, right? Yes. Okay, uh, good morning everyone, dear jury members and our dear friends. We are the first group uh, presenting today our uh, dissertation research. My name is Berin Kocabash. My name is Steven, I'm using Terence microphone to present. And hi, I'm Dobolina. And today's presentation will consist of a brief overview of the topics we're dealing with our analysis on various scales and the experiments conducted until the research development stage. Tsunami is a marine disaster that has affected human settlements for decades. It is one of the most destructive, yet the most unpredictable disaster in human history. The region that you see in red is the ring of fire that is the highly active tectonic zones and the most vulnerable. Yet these coastal developments are home to millions and some are very well developed. Our context, uh, which is Tokyo, is the most development, developed coastal cities in the world, one of them and situated at the northern part of the Tokyo Bay. It is also one of the densest cities and it has been a motivator and innovator for technological advancements in all fields. The bay is one of the busiest trade and commerce networks with six major ports. The reclaimed lands hold the majority of the um, urban financial business and industries that you can see the developments in the video. And our first issue is the marine disasters. 
Here you can see Japan's geomorphological location that has posed a threat to the bay to many major tsunami and earthquakes. The, may, the bay mounts bathymetry and its S shapes also increases the amount of water flow inside the bay. One of the recent tsunami that was unpredicted was the 2011, which is the Tohoku tsunami. It has 14 meter high on the direct impact zone and has led to a three meter high tsunami inside the bay. The propagation time is found to be approximately an hour with multiple hits in intervals of an hour. That also makes the things more vulnerable. And our second issue is the existing defense analysis. Tokyo's defense system consists of multiple seawalls, dikes, floodgates, inland locks, which was capable of stopping the water flow. Yet these solutions create a feeling of imprisonment and disconnect with the sea. With the, with the rise in sea levels, they too need raising. And this was actually our starting point to develop our argument. Here we see the risk inundation map with the risk zones that need raising. We pick the area six and seven for further research. You can go to the next. Uh, this map shows that it will be riskier in case of the flood gate fails. It shows that the area faces worse impact. So the third issue is the urban and the built problems. Uh, so we make an analysis on the lack of green spaces and high density packing within the mid and the high rise clusters, which needs improvement. Uh, and in this analysis of the existing building typologies uh, on the island, we feel that we need to come up with uh, uh, a better argument and uh, an alternative. Uh, in the central zone, it also shows that the area is prone to storm surge due to the low elevation. Uh, this is an analysis that we made to understand the existing evacuation refuge centers present in the place uh, that does not have a clear pathway or strategy. So we come to our research questions, the first being, can tectonic surfaces with channeling capabilities aligned with coastal protection help in creating a more resilient urban fabric to deal with marine disasters? And the second being, can mixed use modular spaces be evolved on the new urban fabric to work with the new water network and build conditions required to cope with the marine disasters? And our hypothesis is gradients of intervention integrated strategically offshore to inland can create a resilient marine defense system and build environment for future Tokyo City. So to understand our approach, we divide our research and experiments into three scales of intervention, the base scale, the intermediary, and the local scale. <clears throat> so we propose strategies such as barrier placement to dissipate the wave energy first at the base scale, then the water guiding techniques at the intermediary scale, integrating the new urban fabric with the inflow of water at the local scale. To do so, we set up analysis tests, CFD tests for barrier and channeling and GA setups, which all happen simultaneously. Starting with the uh, scale one base scale. For the extraction of zones at the base scale for barrier placement, we run a script that combines all overlays values according to density, water velocity, and elevation gradients. In the end, we get four zones out of which Tokyo Kanagawa uh, number two is one of them. And that is what we have selected for further research and development. Uh, as we analyze the Bay Area, uh, the existing mudflats and breeding grounds, uh, we find that that could potentially be connected until the inland areas uh, using our modules for barriers for habitat creation. And this is the outline of the potential placement areas. For the basic experiment setup of barriers, we modeled the land with the center channel 
uh, which shows uh, sizes of the barriers that currently function on lands facing the Japan Trench. Um, uh, the water velocity is 15 meter per second, which is a uh, similar scenario to a five meter high tsunami flow. And we take this for tests. We do four primitive tests, um, uh, varying gap sizes for varying distance from shoreline, angled along channel mouth and varying layers. The CFD tests were conducted on the mouth of the island and layering tests are done to reduce the individual lengths of the barriers so that multiple small barriers can work together and enrich the bank embankment as well. Further tests are done to find conditions suitable for reducing pressure at the corners of the barriers, uh, size reduction by layering and addition of mounds to establish better water flow in the intertidal zone on a daily basis. We narrow down to two module aggregations out of which the second set performs better in terms of lowering the water velocity and flow lines and for habitat creation. As the barriers are placed in and around Tsukushima Island, ship routes are also taken care of for the existing and modified channels. Post CFD tests on straight barriers, other tests were done to modify the barriers in order for it to take less pressure again. And this is the final scenario. Uh, this module is designed to be repeated throughout the base shoreline to act as a defense to dissipate the wave energy uh, in order for the water to enter the channels at a slower pace and the further um, uh, and other than that uh, to also act as intertidal habitat for small mollusks, fishes and crustaceans that exist uh, in the bay area. In this video, you can see a glimpse of the modules uh, placed in front of Tsukushima Island. And the aggregation in front of it. In the, in the, uh, in the sorry, in the, in the, in the media scale, uh, channeling uh, strategy is applied. To start with, uh, simulation in different conditions were made to help us understand the destructive power of tsunami, among which we find out that the condition three, with a partially broken defense, the tsunami creates the worst result. We also analyze the curvature and also the change of, uh, with change of existing channel. Uh, they all indicate that the area around Tsukushima Island, uh, there is a higher risk from tsunami. After uh, understand this, uh, different sets of basic CFD simulation were made to understand the basic hydraulic principles. And then we propose some uh, integrated models and test them using CFD. Among this result, uh, among these integrated models, uh, we choose uh, two of them to, uh, for further application. Uh, one is the more water intake model for the low lying uh, waterfront area to reduce inundation. And the second one is the branching model in the inland channels to dissipate more water uh, energy. We try to apply this integrated model to modify the main uh, and secondary channel, uh, which is already existing in Tsukushima Island. And the GA is made to help us to select the optimum result. And then we choose a patch of this island, the top right part for further development. We zoom into this part uh, first, we try to locate evacuation zones and evacuation center. The goal is to let people have access to the evacuation center, which is showing in the orange cross uh, in 10 minutes walk. And we want it to be uh, evenly distributed. And based on a selected result from this GA, a third GA channel, uh, GA is run. Uh, the goal is to have, uh, have more channel to dissipate more water energy while at the same time have more uh, buildable area.
after these two steps, we have uh, evacuation zones and we have a new land morphology. Then we study different types of network, among which we select the network number four, uh, which perform efficiently both in uh, evacuation use and in daily use. So through our, all our analysis and strategies, we made a 100-year plan, which consists of phases. The first phasing was the barriers, and then we continue with the other phasing for the channels and the network. And now we will be focusing on the cluster scale. And our uh, third scale is the local scale. Uh, the idea is to locate low rise and public functions along the 30 channel following the land morphology. And the public use uh, is the closest to the river, which can be sacrificed when tsunami comes. And then uh, uh, mid rise cluster after the uh, low rise cluster to fit a large population in Tokyo. A basic unit for the aggregation experiments is selected because it is a flexible space filling geometry. And also it has uh, 90 degree angles, which work well uh, for compact interior layout. And it has a lot of variety and uh, spatial possibility. We start to uh, building a distribution and aggregation experiment. Uh, in this ex experiment, we can choose the uh, vertical number of the uh, circulation units. We can change the total unit number. Uh, but when the number is too big, dark rooms start to uh, be generated. And it blocks a, a lot of view. So we can also reduce the number. We can see less dark room and last view being blocked. So based on this, we can make selection. And this low rise uh, cluster uh, result, and, uh, and the result of the low rise cluster will be translated to the environmental input for the mid rise uh, aggregation. Uh, the vision value will be transferred into a field to influence the uh, aggregation of the mid rise. And also the uh, evacuation. Uh, uh, road is also uh, being used as a boundary of the uh, mid-rise aggregation. Uh, this drawing shows a complete picture of the evacuation route as indicated in the red dotted lines from the high-risk area along the river channel towards the mid-rise clusters through the low-rise clusters. Uh, the low-rise cluster is an agglomeration of 10 to 15 units, where one unit acts as the vertical axis, highlighted in yellow. As we start converting the modules into living units, we add corridors that run through the modules connected to the vertical axis, and shared spaces and green terraces are created as we go to the higher floors. Similarly, for the, uh, the mid-rise clusters, the agglomeration has a similar morphology, the difference being that an evacuation common area is plugged in at the first floor that is directly connected with the low-rise clusters. And the dark rooms that got created during the aggregation logic is converted into light wells for solar radiation to reach uh, the interiors. And in this section, we see the relation of the buildings with the landscape and the section of the riverfront where we have the sunken public spaces with water storing capabilities. We also propose indoor and outdoor facilities as diagrams. Uh, in this video, we can see the relation of the low rise and the mid rises and also the riverfront with the bridge connections and open public spaces as we proposed in the beginning of our research. This is a closer look up to the architecture and landscape. We can see how we utilize the open public spaces and uh, the riverfront.
And here we can see those sunken public spaces that has the water storing capabilities. This is a closer look to the public spaces we want to utilize that are uh, semi-open and um, closed ones. We can utilize them as uh, retails. And a basic residential unit is developed uh, for the interior detailing. Uh, we can have uh, different options for the interior layout, and we can have uh, different uh, rooftop gardens on the top of it. And then it gives us a vision of how people can uh, live in this unit. And this is a for this option. So going back to our research question, our initial aim was to create a resilient urban fabric with channeling capabilities and uh, intervention of offshore and, offshore and inland strategies as in our hypothesis. And we want to finalize our presentation with an overview of the scenario where we have five meters of inundation in case of uh, heavy rainfalls or uh, storm surges. And thank you for listening. Thank you. Uh, I think um, Andre has joined us as well. Welcome, Andre. Good morning. Good morning. Um, how are you? Good to, good to good, have you. Good morning. N nice to see you. And apologies for, for joining in um, slightly late. No problem. No problem. Great to have you. Uh, well, thank you, guys. And um, we'd like to ask our jury members um, who would like to start. Irene, Andre, Axel, the floor is yours. Um, I, can, I can start. <coughs> thank you for the nice presentation. I mean, it's a very interesting and very relevant topic, I guess, to for large densities, how to deal with the rising sea level, etc. Um, and I think the three um, strategies, or three scales of strategies you presented are relevant and um, thought through to a quite high level. Um, but I would have still some questions. <laughs> um, for the first one, for this barriers, I think it's interesting and um, um, I mean, I think it's especially interesting for me because um, seven years ago for our thesis, we were dealing with a um, different scenario, uh, with a similar scenario and came up with a very similar shape and very similar aggregation of these shapes to um, slow down the water. But what I did not fully understand in your presentation, how is this um, influencing the um, urban space or what is the significance for the um, urban aggregation of your um, this wave breakers so or this barriers I mean I call it just wave breakers now and what's the um, difference between your proposal and already existing measures to slow down the water I mean this wave breakers I think they're in, in many cities on the sea you find similar structures to slow down the water um, and for the channels, um, it's a similar question. I think, I mean, um, my main question through your presentation was how, is, how are your proposed strategies related to Tokyo? Or did you, um, I mean, for me, it looks a bit like you could also say it's important for cities like Tokyo because they have this and this and this issue. And um, now we propose some strategies which could be implemented in Tokyo, but also in any other city. I mean, this channeling system, did you did you analyze how you could fit this into the urban fabric of Tokyo? Or um, would this be the next step of development? And then the last um, the last topic of this, this building, so I think this is 
a quite nice proposal how you um, generate your, your urban aggregations based on the channeling and um, this zoning approach, but it's again, I mean, um, how, how is this related to Tokyo? Hi, uh, I think I can uh, start to answer your second question. It's about the uh, channel and the urban fabric. Uh, and uh, we are proposing this uh, channeling system, uh, which uh, actually doesn't uh, fit very well with the existing grid system in Tokyo. So the uh, uh, network study, uh, the uh, aggregation is uh, a new architectural system that we propose for a uh, compact PAX boundary and uh, a lot of channels in this uh, waterfront area, how we can locate building, how they can have a better relationship how, and how they can uh, fit a larger population. So uh, yes, it doesn't fit well with the existing grid network. We study, we understand it. So we are trying an alternative uh, proposal uh, to fit in this complex uh, channeling uh, system. Yeah, this is uh, can I, 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 I forgot one question. <laughs> um, this channeling system and also the barriers, um, if there's a tsunami, would they really still help or what's the, the let's say, height of maximum wave <laughs> um, this, uh, this measures would still really protect the city? So for the barrier experiments, um, we were lim limited due to the um, scale um, so we could only uh, do some tests uh, individually on uh, a, like model sets or a certain set of aggregations. And uh, we also um, felt the need to combine the, um, the channeling experiments with the barriers, but due to the, like, the heavy computational uh, logic that needs to be done on the uh, system, uh, we couldn't really do it. Uh, we wanted to see how much of the water could be um, uh, water energy could be dissipated using those modules, um, but we had to apply it directly on the um, Tsukushima Island uh, in front. And then we had to think about okay, if we re reduce the water energy um, until this point, then how would the channeling strategy based on that uh, would could be further developed in order for the um, uh, low uh, low water energy to be transferred inland using other strategies like addition of green tissues and um, again that giving a feedback to the um, construction of the built environment in and around that space so linking each each of them together um, so that was the basic view of the strategy um. <coughs> I have a, a question as well, uh, Salu. Yeah, go ahead, Ari. Uh, I want to congratulate you. I mean, a lot of work uh, and working remotely is not easy. And uh, you picked a topic that is uh, very difficult to simulate with fluid dynamics. Um, I know that very well. Um, what I well, I enjoyed the presentation and I understand the logic of the barriers and, and uh, altering the, the urban fabric with this logic. What I missed in your presentation uh, was a little bit of explanation of how, when it's flooded, what do you need most? You know, the day after the tsunami, whenever, for me, what Tokyo learned is that you need somehow to have your critical infrastructure. And that has to do with the water, energy, you know, and logistics as well, um, away from the ground. So, I would like to ask you, where do you think that critical infrastructure should be and how is integrated to the urban fabric? Because usually you have them in the basements and you have something in the basement like that, New York or Tokyo and many cities that, you know, they, they have flooding problems for all sorts of reasons. They have taken away that from the basements and they struggle to find space for them. And that is well integrated because you can put them on the roof, but as you can see on your roofs, you have these lovely gardens. Uh, you can pin them in the middle, but they take space, so, you know, and they need ventilation, you know, they have certain set of requirements. So where do you see that critical infrastructure? And that is water, energy, and logistics. You go very quickly to bring to these people stuff. Is it food? Is it, you know, I mean, you need your, 
you know, quick logistics to, to reach the site within, let's say, the five hours after the tsunami to check first if people are well and then the second you give them um, support. Um, I would like to hear your opinion here. Okay, uh, I can start answering. Maybe, Stephen, you can continue. Uh, first of all, the logistics and infrastructure is also crucial for our research. That's why uh, in our research, we found it uh, lacking the evacuation spaces because after the, uh, those um, marine disasters happening the day after or two days after, it is also causing some other problems with infrastructure and maintaining other facilities. That's why uh, in our a part of our research is making the evacuation zoning and providing people more uh, the optimum um, like space and also that, that are also uh, placed on the elevated parts. That's why we also modified the land of the island where those evacuation spaces and infrastructure are uh, safer and on like 10 meters above the sea level. So yeah, we also considered uh, these aspects. But how do you reach these spaces, you know, from the rest of Tokyo to support them? From rest, actually, then you reach them by car hmm. when it's all flooded around. It is. We we actually make this uh, part of the research in local scale. Uh, that's why we consider mostly pedestrian uh, access and also car access. But our priority is pedestrian access. Uh, the well, we, we have connections from the bridges that are existing in and around the island. So we take those as points and then we um, we generate the network around. So all the network is generated um, as an offset of the areas that are going to be flooded. If you can go to the uh, yeah. network page yeah. here. Here. Uh, I'm sure. Yeah. So um, I'll post the GA uh, where we uh, settle for the evacuation points, and uh, then from there we um, uh, like generate the tertiary channels. All the network that is being uh, generated are uh, influenced by the direct bridge connections. Uh, so it is at a ten meter level high. Um, uh, um, it's, it's 10 meters high and it is uh, running all around it. And then we are taking the offsets of it. And for the internal connectivity, we, we take uh, the evacuation points, the red, the, the red points that you can see on the right hand side. And then we generate uh, different uh, types of networks to understand which one works the best. And uh, where the neural network um, uh, uh, that we, we, uh, we scripted, that was the best in terms of the least amount of time that a person can take to uh, even uh, to walk and uh, go to the nearest refuge center. And the refuge center is as well connected with the bridge connection. So if in case there is a need for um, extra resources, uh, so like the cars or the uh, main transportation can happen until there. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Aris. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd like to, to join Erin in congratulating you on, on the work that you've done, um, both in terms of the subject matter and in terms of the scope. Uh, I, I very much like how um, you've posed the questions and um, kind of the methodical nature of solving these questions incrementally. And uh, it does seem that one question leads to the other, um, and there's a logical continuity um, that's evidenced in, in the work, which, um, which, which is great. Um, there, there are a couple of things for me where I think um, um, the, the project maybe can, can be strengthened. And, um, and I agree that um, uh, the question of looking at uh, the urban fabric is an important one. I would go back to one of the points you've raised at the beginning, which talks about this idea that currently mitigation measures isolate and segregate the urban population from the water. And there's an implied desire here, both I think in you stating that and also in how you've resolved the architectural scale part of your project uh, in that this defense mechanism becomes um, um, part of the urban amenity offered to the residents and increases the, perhaps the value of the land. You're increasing 
the, the amount of, of, of water penetration and clearly that, that links in with some level of, of, of amenity that's, that's being provided. Uh, and I, I think to me that, that question can go back to actually inform uh, some of the defense mechanisms that you're providing. And in, in, that, um, in that sense, I guess one question for me is um, how you are, um, how, how are you conceiving the kind of archipelago of m mini barriers that you're distributing around? Um, it would be interesting for me to understand uh, why they're the same shape. Uh, does it mean that they're modularly constructed and deployed in a way? Uh, would also be interesting to understand, uh, you know, you're placing people uh, on them and suggesting that they're part of this kind of marine park and, and, and so on. You'd be helpful to understand how they work in terms of expanding the access to the sea from, from the city. You know, are they, are they meant to actually really work together as a kind of this kind of amphibious park, for instance? Um, and and the, the other question also has to do with with um, maybe <clears throat> not per perhaps striking a balance between water's amenity versus the density that's required in the place itself. Um, I I don't know much about this place. I did a very quick Google search as you're talking that the, the, the population density is very very high. Uh, it's almost a thousand people per square kilometer, uh, and uh, and um, and it would be interesting to see how your um, aggregate studies um, support that level of density. Uh, it it might be that it's simply not permissible to have so much empty lands around the channels, uh, and and perhaps th this idea of densifying could even sort of, sort of suggest a series of lamination moves where water is permitted to go underneath the buildings themselves. Mm -hmm. Uh, but water is not present there as an everyday uh, part of your urban experience. Mm. Uh, and, and, and equally, I think what, what will be interesting to sort of to, to, to study, I suppose, is this, this idea of the, of the kind of mat um, aggregates that you're proposing. Um, at the moment, still exists a little bit sort of distributed as kind of objects in a field. There are gaps in between, in between buildings. And you are looking at this idea of dark spaces and so on. It'd be interesting to see how perhaps you can amplify that and test it out even even more for for the for the to actually support the local uh, the, the the local density there. So these just a couple of a couple of things as possible further streams of of, uh, of research. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you Andre. I mean I think all of these important questions um, you know relating to uh, urban fabric, higher network connectivity, integration, density, contextualization, right? You have uh, two weeks to finalize your documents and uh, you have enough time, we think, to reflect on these important questions mm -hmm. to have a, let's say, a more kind of general perspective overview of how this project uh, kind of contributes to, to the urban environment and fabric. Um, Thank you, thank you to all, and congratulations, guys. Um, any other comments or questions, or should we move forward? Yeah, okay. Okay, great, guys, thank you. Thank you for the comments. Cool, let's start with Duanya and Tani. Um, hi, we're Dwani and Tang. Uh, we team Revitalize. Our presentation today will consist of an introduction uh, to our research topics, site analysis, experiments at varying scales, and to end with uh, our design proposal. We're looking at flooding in Indonesia's capital city, Jakarta. It has a long history of dealing with frequent flooding as it is geographically located on the floodplain of 13 rivers. Over the past few decades, rapid urbanization and uh, the resulting informal settlements have often been blamed for worsening the situation. While this is true, the dwellers of these settlements also suffer the most from flooding as they often live in poor conditions close to the river. 
The city's government has had many schemes with the ambition to resolve these issues in the past. While each of these projects has some promising elements to solving individual issues, there are also many flaws. Most importantly, these projects were often planned and executed with lack of consideration for community. The government rental flats do not provide the informal uh, special dynamics that are vital to the, these local communities. Which brings us to our research question, which is, can a resilient framework for riverfront development of Southeast Asian cities be developed, responding to challenges caused by flooding and unplanned urbanization, while adapting to future population growth through ecological landscaping and a building system evolved from local vernacular typologies? To test the strategies, we've chosen a patch between the uh, South and East Jakarta along the Silivang River. Around 80% of the site are considered as informal settlements and distribution of housing are very dense. A strategy concerns with the replacement of these informal settlements with a more resilient urban fabric. The aim of our urban strategy is to explore ways to integrate flooding mitigation, flood mitigation strategy as the skeleton in urban zoning. As the river meanders, the inside of the bends uh, tend to be more prone, uh, more prone to flood as our flood simulation overlaid here has shown. It is in these areas where flooding is difficult to avoid completely. Keeping in mind the river dynamics and uh, data mapping of environmental factors like distance to river, flood inundation, surface runoff, and slope, a combined flood risk assessment was carried out to identify high, mid, and low flood risk zones on the site. It also helped us to identify flood retention zones on the site. We're addressing... Um, we are addressing the flooding at various scales. At an urban scale, we have landscape strategies. The area inside the bend of the river be more prone to as shown by the flood simulation. Find this area as a soft team, collecting future stress flood water during this um, event. These terraces are designed with topographic variation to support range of ecological condition from on to certain seasonal wetland to park and green space. Um, go to the sink river banks. We are looking at the existing river bank section. The house built close to the river on the yeah, and it has a lot of cars near the riverside. Um, so it's come to our vacations strategies like to increase the absorbing area of repair areas by integrate with land and increase the flood control by rewater like the local land and species and increasing ecological policy. We look at native riparian vegetation along the Rang River based on types and function, especially wetland vegetation, helped in ecological force um, for the flood control and made ecosystem that made a fit to the flood control as the field. The vegetation mapping is based on the different um, loads in area. So for the section in each Part of repairing through the different terrain on each side include the widening downstream section. This increased roughness of the natural river bed and widening of river help to slow down the water volume. The greenway strategies we, it address the key issue of flood management quality as increased absorption area plants and allow water as to the to the sewer system strategies was to identify incoming primary and secondary streets, providing them um, the greenway state. Like we have, we introduced three different sections of greenway. The first is um, primary street with Ulewa and the uh, and the secondary street with pathway with the green patch 
and also with the porous as well material in secondary growth and pedestrian. The rest of the urban fabric is less prone to fluvial flooding. However, if left uh, covered densely with buildings and hard surfaces will contribute to increased surface runoff during heavy rainfall. Uh, hence, the strategy in these areas is to make more space for water through temporary attenuation facilities and retention ponds as rain gardens, which not only help to deal more eff effectively with heavy rainfall, but they also filter and clear runoff. We've designed a genetic algorithm to locate hydrological functions on the site, the attenuation facilities and the rain gardens. Another ambition of the GA is to generate a street network on the site to link these hydrological functions also to locate nodes of public buildings close to the green spaces. Uh, these are the few selected results from the uh, genetic algorithm. It includes fit, fittest individuals for fitness objectives and some individuals uh, from Pareto front. Uh, to further filter out from the selected results, we did a post analysis to measure the centrality closeness on the generated street network. And the solution we selected not only performs better in terms of centrality of secondary and pedestrian street network, but also there is increase in accessibility to roads along the river and existing street network outside of the site. The architectural system of the core flag stride. When the color and existing building typologies were studied, we abstract the system meant that respond to the local environmental factors, such as coral wall panels, placement of the opening, and sloping roof. Consider using local, locally available resource material, which is bamboo, with modern approach for laminate, bamboo, and engineering. The primary strategy of aggregation process for housing unit is derived from the special logic of the Malay house. The uh, Topological relationship between the spaces were studied to determine the rules of adjacency, incremental aggregation, and level of co compactness or preference of long side connections. Uh, studies on local demography trends show that there is a decline in large households and increase in smaller families and single person dwelling. As these will be reflected in the housing demand, we propose four types of housing units that cater to different groups of the population multiple aggregation for each housing typology were generated based on the rules. And to filter from these results, we did an integration analysis of the uh, aggregations generated. Our aim was to choose a unit, uh, with, uh, our aim was to choose a unit with higher integration value for a space which is going to be a public or semi-public and lower integration value for more private uh, spaces within the house. Um, this is our chosen results of five with the abstraction of many genes. In terms of providing house, the long house, providing housing for, for a community, a color long house, Masati, the emphasis on communal space is very different to rental apartments. This inspired deriving. The building phenotype with the aim to evolve molecular lock technology to suit the needs of modern households. Instead of recreating the longhouse technology in multiple stories by specific spying the location of the communal space, this 3D communal space can wind, join mine, the people circulation with stairs from TD Street into each building. This building system shoulder, I think that's um, abstractor chair communal space that we built our building to our. Another ambition for the architectural system was to develop a framework that combines the planned provision of infrastructure with flexibility in organization. Therefore, the buildings were designed in a way that aggregates several cores which will carry the bathrooms of the housing unit. Starting on the lowest floor, the algorithm aggregates the public spaces and work units, thus making it possible for the housing units and shared spaces to be elevated on the elevated from the ground. 
two typologies were introduced to adapt to different environmental condition within the riparian and urban areas. The elevated riparian building is of terrace typology with green open spaces facing towards the river. It is smaller in size with less housing units, while the urban typologies are more dense and bigger and of bigger plot sizes, while at the same time also have more voids and shared green spaces spread around uh, for increased ventilation. Um, based on the zones defined by the risk assessment at an urban scale, we've identified different building block densities and plot sizes, and to further explore different morphologies of the building yielded by varying core position, an experiment was created uh, to vary core positions to more peripheral, central, and linear arrangements to generate different aggregations for each housing, uh, for each density type. For high density blocks, the core location also affects the distribution of circulatory network within the building system to more central vertical cir circulation in some typologies to uh, while more peripheral in others. For riparian uh, typologies of mid and low density, the change in co-position affects the change in orientation of terraces uh, generated along the housing units. Um, smaller plot size of the riparian typologies leads to a more closely packed housing aggregation, while larger plot size of the urban typology uh, makes the building morphology more porous for increased ventilation and more uh, shared spaces distributed along the floor. Uh, we've used all possible uh, generated aggregations for each density type to further distri distribute them on the site. We've mapped the existing programmatic distribution in a cluster within the existing administrative boundary. Other than the hydrological functions that were previously distributed on the site, varying density residential blocks with work units on the ground floor Distribution of other public functions and communal functions were also taken into the consideration. We ran a rectangle uh, packing algorithm on the previously generated clusters to distribute different plot sizes for varying block density on the site. The building plots generated uh, were then used to carry out another genetic optimization algorithm to distribute housing aggregation uh, on the site. The, this this uh, algorithm was designed to use the earlier generated housing aggregation as a pool of solutions to select from and distribute them across the site. Our fitness objectives for the optimization were to maximize housing units, to minimize solar gain received by the aggregation, to minimize number of housing closer to the river, keeping in mind accessibility during a flood, flooding event. The outcome of aggregation is therefore distribution of housing aggregation on the site keeping in uh, mind various factors like distance from the river, orientation of housing units, and number of housing units being distributed. Um, we've chosen uh, the fittest individual, uh, the one with average of fitness rank. Um, in, in this cross section from the chosen result, it is visible the building morphology, although coming from the same um, architectural system, uh, would respond to become uh, and become in, integrated to local context and infrastructure, which results in more resilience towards flooding. Uh, here we've laid our building aggregation with urban scale strategies of terrace landscapes and greenways. Also uh, shown here are the hierarchy of street network and elevated uh, network generated. Uh, to reflect back at our research question, which was kind of resilient framework of river flood, for riverfront development of Southeast Asian cities, we developed responding to challenges caused by flooding and unplanned urbanization while adapting to further future population growth, ecological landscaping and building system evolved from local vernacular typologies. Uh, we, uh, various strategies were deployed at different scales to respond to challenges caused by flooding and unplanned urbanization while providing provision for provision of housing for future population growth at the same time providing a resilient urban fabric with provisions for communal and public spaces and functions here we have simulation for how the river conditions have changed while providing space for public 
of the river front areas. Simulation for the planting season, the elevated rock with the main circulation window. The terrace in riparian building shows um, the, what the riverside with the elevated walkway green space. The terrace in um, the connect elevated walkway to the buildings for the sections see the trees. So I chose Amory Pond that's used as a public function. And it's going to be kind of my options. Mm, thank you. Thank you. Um can you perhaps keep the, the presentation? Yeah. Maybe one of the five, maybe the, the slide where you were showing the different scales. Mm -hmm. You know, the building scale, the urban and riparian zones. Who is sharing the screen, guys? Duani Tank, can you please bring up the uh, presentation yeah. again? Great. Yes, perfect. Great. Thank you. Okay, who would like to jump in? Well, I can. Again, you know, I'm, I'm glad that this, you know, on the lines of the same, whatever, topic, flooding and defense mechanisms, uh, a lot of work, you know, and uh, and, and, and a lot of, and some analysis really, you know, I didn't see thorough analytical approach in the way you approach the problem, you know, like explaining, you know, up to which point the water goes, you know, I mean, I didn't see the use of any analysis tools um, to predict and also, you know, then test your um, design solutions if they work. And, and my second question is, the developments, you know, the, the system, the, the, the massing system, the, the housing system you have developed, I'm not so clear how it works. Is it raised from the ground? The, you know, uh, because I do see the ground floor occupied. Uh, I don't fully understand how the units are connected to create a public space, which is so important, you know, for a community. I do see individual housing blocks connected with a bridge. A bridge is not the best medium to, to create a, a public space, uh, in my opinion, but I would like to hear your views. Um, the other thing is, you talked about the climate and your response to that, which is, you know, big overhangs, big roofs, a lot of shading. But I do see your public spaces, which is the ones I see here, this, they're very large and totally unshaded. And, and somehow I feel that in order to create a successful community, it needs to somehow, the spaces in between the blocks are very important. Mm -hmm. And how you negotiate, you know, uh, that space is the holy grail. How in that space in between you manage the floods, uh, you make sure that people have space to socialize, that is accessible to everyone and it doesn't have a lot of steps up and down because you have to look at, you know, the aging population, you know. The public space, you know, in older cities is successful because of the same level and you can go everywhere hmm, within that city, that village, without having to go up and down steps. Because the moment you do that, you somehow separate people based on their ability to walk or go up and down steps with ease. Um, and I stop here. I would like to hear, you know, like um, your views on, on these issues. Um, like to answer your second question about like, how what's uh, with the building system if they're elevated so we have like two types of building morphologies one for riparian which are elevated on stilts with uh, nothing happening on the ground floor but for the urban morphologies the uh, ground floor is occupied by work units while the housing units are aggregated on upper levels 
uh, and yeah, the other question about uh, yeah, like about the uh, experiments uh, that you said to like to predict where the water goes, like that 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 really is something very interesting, and we would like to like have work on it. However, we were not able to do so because of the time constraints and. Like our main focus was architectural and building system at that, yeah. But how did you resolve the public space, for example? How, how what's your opinion on, on the public spaces you have created? Are they? So uh, one thing, uh, we, we've uh, made provisions for public uh, space. Mm -hmm two scales. One is at uh, ponds and these uh, open spaces in uh, between these urban blocks and the other are like more uh, riverfront public spaces. But these riverfront public spaces are also like our terraced uh, landscape for dense vegetation, which will help in like flood, uh, slowing down the water. At the same time, making space for green, uh, making more space for uh, water to infiltrate like in the ground. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, I'll, I'll repeat the, the comment I made on the first presentation is when you have these areas that they're prone to flooding frequently, you know, you could argue that like it's like almost like tired, you know, comes it down every day, you have to learn how to live with it, which means that you mm -hmm. can't have your public space flooded mm -hmm. for a period of time or, you know, before flooding or just after flooding because it's not accessible. Mm -hmm. So for me, a successful public space is the one that is resilient and you can use it, you know, even when the, because flooding should be your friend, you know, mm -hmm. and life should just go on as normal, you know, within five hours of, of a flooding event, you know, I mean, not perhaps, a, you know, a major tsunami, but nevertheless, that type of situation here, you know, I should expect even your road sections that mm -hmm. I saw them going down, they should go up. You know what I mean? You know, you have your typical road section that, you know, you have your greenery and then, you know, you dip mm -hmm. the street down that's not perhaps the best response when you have flooding frequently, no? because that street will be damaged every time you have an event. So uh, what I would like you perhaps to elaborate in the next whatever few days you have left is make sure that, you know, your critical spaces, for me, public spaces, not every public space, but some of them, you know, like they should be resilient and they should enable life 24 seven, you know, not disrupt, you know, and then back again. And the rest is extra to have. It's like you open your parks, for example. You don't go to the park every every day. You go to the park where the weather is nice. Mm -hmm. So all this, you know, open space I see there that they help you, you know, with the defense mechanisms. They're great to have. You know, they they offer great views, but they shouldn't be critical to the to the everyday life. Yes, I mean, you guys have two weeks now to address these really significant questions about, you know, accessibility, public spaces, resilience. Uh, reviewing, reflecting on, on the sectional qualities of your drawings, right? So it would be best to spend time reflecting on these, let's say, uh, important uh, overall issues. Yeah. Uh, just, just to add, um, I think, um, Elif, the, the sectional quality, I think it's, it's really um, it's really quite key for me, I think, in, in, in this project, because um, just um, in addition to the public um, round question, which I think it's it's um, it's is uh, sort of spot on. Um, I I have to say I, I I really like your your building system, and I think it has a fantastic richness, and um, it um, it really seems to kind of upscale um, in a successful way and kind of leverage some of the qualities of the vernacular um, to kind of create this aggregate, but. Um, I'll be very curious to understand a little bit more about the building methodology and the materials that you're implying uh, are, are, are being used here. Uh, because there is a hint that at the moment, uh, you're almost sort of proposing kind of a shelf system where we have this kind of concrete, and I'm not sure that's the case, but that's sort of what the renderings are suggesting. There's a kind of a concrete core with, with flat slabs. And then we have these kind of cassettes that are maybe timber or, or use timber elements and they're being plugged in. Um, and and part of that question, I suppose, uh, and yeah, if you have a diagram that shows that better rather than this, maybe maybe we can look at that. But um, I think if, um, in, in a way, what would be helpful to understand are kind of the degrees of freedom built in your system. Um, 
so one is to sort of say, well, you know, is which part of the shelf is built first? And how is the shelf being added on incrementally? Because plans inevitably will change. Um, but also in this kind of smaller level where we we stack different typologies one on top of the other. And of course, the, the bathrooms may not line up or the wet risers may not line up. Is there a question then that the slab itself has a built-in level of flexibility where these services can be rerouted in a very ad hoc way you know it's it's a we, we don't maybe we don't need to kind of pre-plan everything and and leave things open to chance but um it, it's it's almost i think i wonder if, if if you could maybe do a little bit more just to to show how um your system actually permits this kind of wonderful richness that you you're proposing in the renderings mm -hmm. Um, I would like us to <clears throat> add one last comment. I mean, I think I, I wrote, I mean, most of the questions I wrote down um, have been asked already. Um, but I think maybe you should refine a little bit in the book that at the end is um, you, you're mentioning your uh, genetic algorithm, which places your um, water storage points, etc. And I mean, if you run through it as fast as in the presentation, I mean, I was not able to see any difference in between the different outcomes. I think there needs a little bit more explanation of um, what are the parameters and um, so on. And I think um, um, I personally also have a bit of trouble to understand. I mean, at the beginning, you, you started to talk about um, the flooding issue in Jakarta, and especially with this informal settlements. Um, then you propose this, um, I mean, you propose to clear the whole site around this river, um, build a terrace system, and then build new buildings on top of it. Um, is this your answer to the informal settlements? Like uh, our, I'm um, just looking for a slide where I can show that. Sorry. Um, so our main reason to demolish building on the site were because of because these uh, unplanned settlements sort of uh, this like uh, these dwellers living in these settlements have like the. the problem is with the river edge condition. So whenever they flood, there's la like the accessibility and the mobility of these site is sort of, uh, like it hampers the daily life. And like our idea of uh, demolishing the building and sort of generating a more resilient urban fabric wash to uh, uh, sort of design something which is more resilient to flooding uh and yeah like keep keeping uh, like so that people can live with flood because uh there's the amount of water like the amount of uh, flooding and rainfall that jakarta gets it like it's hard to stop the flooding entirely so like our uh, idea was to sort of make it make the urban fabric more resilient instead of uh, adding uh, strategies to stop it stop the flooding or stop the water from entering the site. And what is happening to the people who are living there at the moment? Sorry? What is happening to the people living there? Uh, I don't get the question, like what is happening as in? I mean, if you, I mean, it looks like there are people living. Yeah. And before you demolish it, they need to go somewhere. So, uh, like, uh, the, the idea is that uh, a lot of these governmental schemes for people uh, to move from, like, the reverse side to these schemes. And our, our proposal is to replace the system into a more uh, sort of dynamic uh, urban fabric where people can still uh, have that informal uh, informal way of living like they would have in informal settlements but making it more resilient to flooding. Yeah, I'm not 100% convinced, but it's also, I think this, 
I don't know. I think you you um, you you should maybe clarify your problem a little bit better at the beginning, or at least explain then on um, how your solution responds to the problem you explained. I mean, what's what's exactly the issue you are working with, or which aspects of this you are not taking into consideration? Yeah. And on the, which levels of this problem you try to find or uh, propose solutions? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If I can offer one, maybe because this this image is actually really interesting, and, and and I don't know, maybe this may be a misreading of your project, but in a way, what it seems you're saying is that you know at the moment there there is. Um, uh, in addition to being kind of the de facto urbanism in um, in this area, the the slum. And I'm not using this in a pejorative way. Offers a, um, uh, a you know a, a level of urban intensity and a kind of a, a, a quality of of life and uh, that mm -hmm. that is not replicated in this kind of scaled up housing schemes. That yeah. is the problem. <laughs> and essentially, what you're proposing in a way is, which is I think is really interesting, is to sort of say, well, actually, can can there be an infrastructure, a three-dimensional infrastructure proposed, which is the equivalent of the street and the plot mm -hmm. as a three-dimensional matrix that allows for the vitality and the energy and the, the you know, of, of, of the of the slum uh, and moves away from uh, the kind of this kind of, you know, monolithic housing block, which is very alien uh, you know, to the vernacular, and and therefore, again, I'm, I'm going to go back to that. I think it's very important to actually express the nature of this three-dimensional infrastructure, just as we have sewers and streets and blocks. How is this extrapolated three-dimensionally? Your slabs maybe might be a little bit thicker than shown, or you know, there might be some changes, and and it would be nice to see how that's uh, described. But I think the problem is really interesting. And, and perhaps if I can add, I mean, to, to what Andre and Axel said, um, it's important to think about the wider implications in terms of scale, you know, like of infrastructure, the infrastructure that you're proposing. Certainly, it's not just bound by the site that you are dealing with, but it will have wider implications in the urban fabric. So it's important to, to think about that and to perhaps propose, you know, for the future, what type of infrastructure can be, can be uh, let's say, um, extrapolated within the urban realm and how it could help with flooding with, with, with issues of resilience, you know? So it's, it's also important to think about the different scales that you're addressing. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, um, any other comments, questions, thoughts? Silence, so I guess. That's it. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank let's you. Move, let's move to our next project. Every, hello, everyone. Uh, Maria um, is just scaring, sharing her screen. One second. Can you guys see our screen? Hello everyone, today we'll be discussing how our initial research into alternative concrete composites incorporating desert sun lead us to our site Alan in the United Arab Emirates and to the study and reincorporation of sustainable and vernacular principles in our design proposal. This is how we are going to present and run through our presentation divided into domain, design experiments, design development, design proposal, and conclusions. Our initial research focused on consumption of sand for concrete production in the construction industry. This helped us identify the UAE as the fifth larger importer of construction sand. Although the land mass of the UAE is 80% sand, this is not used in the construction due to the desert sand surrounded particle geometries. The main reason desert sand is not used in the construction industry is due to its fine particle size and inability to bind well with other materials. There is a lot of potential for desert sand concrete composite, which we'll be exploring further. The rapid, um, in terms of urban, the rapid urban, unplanned urban development in the United Arab Emirates since the 1960s have followed a typical Western trajectory 
largely focused on automotive transport combined with the lack of transportation options and walkable space, which resulted in a dispersed and segregated city. These three neighborhoods located in three different cities in the UAE reiterate the points made it earlier. At the urban scale, the principles which we extracted from our extensive research into traditional cities in the Arabian Gulf is the compactness of neighborhoods. This diagram shows principles of how to design compact neighborhoods that includes high built density, diversity of urban programs, walkable streets, and hierarchy of networks, and a variety of transportation options. At an architectural level, the rapid urban growth also led to architectural proposals based on Western paradigms that were reflected in the materials used in construction systems such as steel and glass and spatial configurations that were not sensitive to the culture and family structures of the local population, the Emirates. The use of these conventional materials in this arid, arid climate has led to an increase of mechanical cooling systems to obtain thermal conflict, comfort, which is highly unsustainable. The vernacular principles which we will be incorporated into our design proposal are elements typical of traditional courtyard houses in the region. These guarantee both thermal comfort while allowing a gradient of privacy and program distribution valued by the Emirates. These traditional elements such as air shafts, openings, bodies of water facilitate passive cool systems such as cross ventilation, other elements which are incorporated are the use of shared walls and shady devices such as mascherabias, pagos, and vegetation. Concrete, concrete, steel, and glass are the most commonly used building materials, but the lack of planning, communication barriers between architects, engineers, and the construction companies results in delays, absence of efficient resource planning, and thus the generation of construction waste. This is also seen with the national housing program where the demand is higher than the production and the average wait time, including paperwork formalities, is around 15 years. To create a reduction in the material waste as well as more efficient construction timelines and fast assemblies, research was conducted on prefabrication techniques for different architectural elements. For our roof, specifically, we chose to implement the Catalan vault system because it works primarily under compressive in a favor of a concrete composite. The walls and opening systems inspired by the Paraguayan system were used because it allowed a variety of panels geometries and prefab structural elements were implemented due to the fast assemblies that allow simultaneous build. Based on demographic research conducted in the UAE, it was discovered that Alain, a city within the region of Abu Dhabi, has the 30% of Emirati population within the country, while the city has a strong cultural connections and many historic neighborhoods, new housing is in demand by the local Emirati population. Additionally, a land located in the advantageous uh, is advantageous as it's located close to the vast resource of desert sand. The city faces harsh summers with high temperatures, flash floods, and winter seasons, as well as high east and west wind velocities. This is our experiment floor chart. Our system was divided into different scales, being material, urban cluster, architecture, and fabrication. Each of these scales resulted in a set of experiments that were interlinked with each other and created multiple feedback loops, leading us to a final design proposal. This would be explained further in the following slides. For our material aim, we wanted to create a building material primarily out of desert sand that was combined with binders that are locally sourced and abundant in the United Arab Emirates. We began our material experimentation by testing different binders and locally sourced desert sand at home in Dubai. We experimented with three different types of binders, including synthetic binders such as polyvinyl acetate, natural binders such as polylactic acid, clay, cement, as well as byproducts of industrial processes local to the UAE, such as fly ash and slag, which is also known as GGBS. Cubes of five by five centimeters were produced and evaluated based on curing time, shrinkage, and water usage. Fly ash and GGBS met these criteria most successfully based on the initial testing and our inclination to create a more sustainable building material that performs similarly to concrete. We chose these binders mixed with cement to be tested at a larger scale. After our initial evaluations, both fly ash and slag were combined with cement using different ratios in order to create our samples using the, using the C15 mix ratio for compression testing. Each 10 by 10 sample was left to cure for seven days before we did the test and sample four, which was comprised of a 50-50 ratio of GGBS and cement as the binder, along with local desert sand, achieved a compressive strength of 9.9 .9 newtons per millimeter squared at day seven and was predicted to reach a 15 newton per millimeter squared um, compressive strength after curing completely. 
Overall, we developed a concrete composite primarily made out of desert sand with materials sourced within 110 kilometers of our site. For our urban aim, we wanted to create a compact urban path patch with modern transportation systems that enabled different hierarchies of urban networks, a variety of programs and multiple gradients of privacy. The selected site is located in the city of Al Ain in the Al Oaina neighborhood. It covers an area of around 146 hectares and was chosen due to its close proximity to the town center industrial area and its designation as a residential neighborhood in the 2030 Al Ain master plan. One of the main features of the site is a wadi, which is an intermittent river that runs along the north and east boundaries of the site. Our first experiment focused on partitioning the plot into blocks which were further subdivided into groups of neighborhoods resulting in primary, secondary and tertiary transport systems, as well as pedestrian networks that allow different gradients of privacy. An orthogonal grid was chosen to subdivide this urban plot and is linked to the architectural scale and strategy to reduce thermal gain on the building. This grid also has ease of drivability in response to the principles explained in the domain chapter. Fitness criteria one and two aim to reduce motor oriented networks, fitness criteria three and four aim to create compact and high density neighborhoods, and fitness criteria five aims to increase thermal comfort and allow for more public spaces and walkability. For the GA results, the simulation had multi multiple conflicting criteria, therefore it was difficult to narrow down on one individual and the average of the fitness ranks was selected. It is important to highlight that although this was an average in individual, it was in the second last generation, which means the simulation was heading to optimization. Also, this is one of the multiple options that could have been developed throughout the thesis. After the selection of the individual, two types of space syntax analyses were conducted. Both between the centrality and closeness centrality highlighted certain primary roads that were centrally located and highly accessible. This data was used in order to position a variety of urban functions, create links between existing transport routes with our urban plot. Our selected site is also prone to flash flooding due to the wadi that runs along the north and east boundaries of the site. These diagrams show the flow of the water based on existing topographical analyses, as well as how the wadi performs and floods during different seasons. The city of Elaine has three wadis running through the city with multiple wells that are interconnected in an underground irrigation system. We have designed our own irrigation system on the urban plan that would be linked to the citywide one. The system on our site is used for evaporative cooling in the alleyways to irrigate the green spaces, as well as act as an overflow system in case of flash flooding. These sectional diagrams show a variety of programmatic options for residents along the river channel that enable usage of the wadi during different seasons, as well as during flash floods. Native vegetation species were also researched and allocated on the river to increase the thermal comfort and more importantly, absorption of water during flash floods. Um, for our cluster aim, we aim to create a new integrated topological system for low rise buildings that allows a different gradients of, gradients of privacy whilst increasing social interaction and having the ability to adapt based on evolving needs of Emirates and expatriates families in Ale. This is the chosen cluster for following analysis due to its proximity to the Wadi as well as a variety of network systems. Based on demographic data and existing Emirati housing in the UAE, we extracted some programmatic data such as areas and bedroom requirements that can be used for various type family types. Eight different geometries types were created to respond to area requirements and create a variety of built coverage and different courtyard dispositions. This experiment focused on creating a variety of volumetric and spatial configurations that result in building footprints and courtyard spaces. The first two fitness criteria aim to create more interactive spaces. The third fitness criteria aims to create a variety of house types for different families. Fitness criteria four and five aim to reduce the overall radiation exposure and increase the internal comfort of the spaces. The first nine individuals from the last generation were instructed to run a post analysis on a further developed the cluster scale. Due to limitations with initial experiments, we segregated the cluster design into two. For the second part of the selection criteria was created to determine the individual that has a maximum internal path length, through path, and maximum number of connections to the boundary of the cluster. This relates to creating an integrated network between the cluster scale, its surroundings, and the overall urban network. Individual zero of Gen 99 was chosen because it has the highest values in all the criteria. This chosen individual was further designed to achieve a segregation of public pathways and private courtyards. A four meter walkway for the public was created using the through line, 
through pathline connections were only created with alleyways to retain a sense of privacy. The rest of the space were used for private and public usage and buildings were elevated one meter to allow for additional level of privacy. The, these diagrams show at a high level the high level the relationships between various street types, transportation networks, as well as the internal cluster relationships. To achieve our fabrication aim was to achieve a mixed construction system that uses different prefabrication techniques using local materials and less formwork that makes the fabrication and construction process more resource efficient and allows for faster assemblies. Based on our material composite and its structural abilities, compression vaults were studied and designed. A, pre a preliminary finite element analysis was conducted to select to select the shown modules. All of these modules have the same curvature but different heights and were analyzed in terms of tension, strength, and solar radiation. These modules demonstrated low tension stress levels and low radiation exposure on the roof as well. These modules will be combined with the structural system shown on the right when necessary, and beams and re reinforced concrete slabs will, added, will be added to a module according to the program. To tie in the cluster scale and the modules together, a program distribution was conducted on the designed individual. The modules were then populated and adapted to respond to the program. Four different modules accommodate different height spaces and have different rules of aggregation and positions within the cluster. Um, for the panels and openings and doors, we des um, were, were designed utilizing the information from the previous fluid dynamics experiment conducted in the MSC phase. Draft angles of 45 degrees were used to create directional openings. Multiple self-shading options were designed for the panels. Oh, sorry. Um, so these were the fluid dynamic tests that we were doing at 45 degree angles. These draft angles and the use of mushrobia show a decrease of temperature within the internal spaces. Um, for the panels and openings, we used the 45 degree draft angle as well as um, new openings, in, as well as new panels that were designed. Multiple self-shading options were designed and um, used for the rest of the wall. Radiation analysis was conducted and two panels were selected um, that will be implemented in the final design. Different types of walls with various openings were designed in order to respond to different programmatic and environmental requirements. Larger openings were used for spaces that overlooked private areas or had less sun exposure, and smaller openings were used for spaces that overlooked public private areas and had more sun exposure. The two final forms for the panels were then tested at a small scale to see how efficient different fabrication techniques were. The first one was a foam and plywood cast, and the second one was, in, was a sand and plywood cast. The sand casting technique was adap adapted to be conducted at home. The aim of this experiment was to analyze both techniques in terms of original mix alteration, drying times, and repeatability. The initial mix was used for the plywood and the foam cast and used as a guide test. The curvature was accurate, but the lack of water resulted in a highly textured finish. The initial material mix for the sand cast um, uh, also resulted in a component that drained water out faster into the sand and resulted in a crumbly texture towards the upper half of the component. The addition of water fixed this problem and improved the finish. However, the components were more prone to chipping and breakage. Both techniques performed well in terms of their respective materials used. Foam casting with plywood was used as a guide test and we observed that the repeatability would be reduced due to their water permeability and deterioration in the foam and the plywood. Sand casting with ply allows for less material usage because the sand can be repurposed, but the fabrication time itself was elongated. This could be industrialized to be a faster and resource efficient process. A further test would be more insightful for the sand to determine its efficiency without plywood as the site supports. We will now move on to our design proposal. Um, this is the cluster scale ground floor plan. This shows a relationship between the architecture of private courtyards, public spaces and internal pathways. Um, this section shows the different levels within the cluster, the houses, as well as the public and private pathways. Um, one house was chosen to highlight the spatial quality of the space and the relationship between the architectural elements. These floor plans show the use of the internal space and spatial qualities within the house, its public courtyard and private courtyard. This section shows the double height spaces that are used for living rooms and other spaces such as bedrooms and terraces. Each house has a terrace on the first floor as well as in the 12 meter modules. This diagram highlights the four main types of architectural elements that are compiled to create one house, which are the roofs, the structural system, the foundations, and the prefabricated panels. We also have a quick video to show you how um, this works. So first we have a foundations going in, 
Um, then we have our structural elements, which include the slabs and the stairs, the roofs, the panels on three different levels, um, the glass, the planters, and our final mushrabia and shading devices that are used across the cluster. The Catalan roof um, is a system constructed of three different materials. Bricks are laid with mortar um, at three different angles to enhance the structural capacity of the vault. To increase the thermal comfort within the space, a locally sourced insulating material, which is date palm fiber mesh, is sandwiched between the brick layers. Three different panel types are used within the architectural system, and this is how they aggregate together. Each element has an interlocking system as well as rebars to prevent from buckling. Um, these are some of our renders that show the different levels, different um, arch types, private and public courtyard spaces. Yes. And for our conclusions, we're not going to go through all of this. We're just going to be very brief. For our material system, we did achieve um, what we wanted to achieve. So we did create a concrete composite that was primarily using desert sand um, as its construction material. And it can be assumed that this um, environmental impact would be much less than uh, a conventional concrete. Um, for our urban scale, we achieved the compact urban patch that integrated the pedestrian networks and the transportation networks. More public spaces were allocated following the LN 23rd master plan requirements. We were also successful in integrating the urban scale with the architecture scale. For our cluster, we did produce multiple morphologies, which allowed um, various multifunctional spaces and differing gradients of privacy. Um, the integration of the internal clusters and the alleyways is sort of seamless and encourages walkability and social interaction in um, a, a country where segregated neighborhoods are sort of the norm. Um, for our architecture, we um, based on computational fluid dynamics and radiation, it can be assumed that less mechanical systems would be required um, to cool the interior spaces during the summer months, which can get quite hot. And with our fabrication system, there is a lot of potential and a lot of testing that still could be done to enhance this further, but we did create a, and tested a doubly curved surface within the sand cast. And that's all we have for today. Thank you. Thank you. Would you like to um, open one of your maybe visualizations uh, yeah. uh, on the cluster scale? Yeah, like something like this. I want you to do at some point, like a photo. OK. Yeah. Maybe I can start with them. Questions. First of all, um, thank you very much. Very interesting um, presentation. Um, very, very um, relevant topic from both sides. I think this um, design, I mean, building design, traditional building design or related to traditional buildings in this area, but also this idea of using sand <coughs> for the concrete. And, um, I think I would like um, mainly to um, ask about this concrete question. Um, I'm not an expert in concrete, but I know that there's um, a lot of research going on to use this desert sand for concrete. Um, so I was quite surprised that you solved the issue, <laughs> which is nice. <laughs> but um, um, what did you do different um, than all the other people working on the same topic? Or um, how do you compare yourself to them? Um, I think for ours, we did a lot of experimentation initially. And um, I do have to say, we did sort of waste a lot of time in a way on doing um, material tests with things that sort of had not worked for others, but we were still sort of hopeful initially during the early stages of the thesis. But then once we started narrowing down and finding um, more, let's say, byproducts of the processes, we found that a lot of people had not done the testing with, let's say, the fly ash or the slag. Or even if there was, there wasn't much literature. So we wanted to see for ourselves um, how this could be combined with another binder 
And we found that, um, I also have some other images that we've taken with a microscope that I didn't put in the presentation, but we found that um, it is quite compact. So once the material has set and dried, it is very compact. And we were also quite surprised to achieve the structural strength that we did. Um, but I think we, um, we sort of used a finer binding material. I think that was what we did different. So the fly ash and the GGBS, the both, both the materials, um, they're finer than um, the other ones that have been tested. So they sort of compact better. So I think that was what we sort of did differently. And um, how is your concrete in comparison to a standard construction concrete? Um, so we use the C15, um, let's say ratio. And with what the, C, what the different ratios um, state, so if you have a C15 or a C20 or C25, the number is associated with the structural strength that you achieve at, let's say, 30 days. So when we did our strength test, it was at 9.9 .9 newtons per millimeter squared, the structural strength, at day seven. So when we compared this to other concrete or, and drying times, it can be assumed that ours would also be a C15 mix. And we did not have time to experiment with different um, with different ratios, so different um, compressive strength ones. But the C15 one that we did try, it would reach the maximum structural capacity required in com as, say, as the same way as other concrete would. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm I'm curious. I think <clears throat> again. I I, I think uh, your your project is great in that you know it, it it's relevant. I think in terms of ambition, it's relevant in terms of um, the location. It's relevant in in terms of um, looking at the typologies. And I really enjoyed the the rigor uh, with which you you've analyzed. Um, the um, urban morphologies and the translation of those morphologies at the architectural scale. So th th I, I thought that's really, really terrific. One, one thing where I, I, would, I think would be helpful to um, push a bit more is, is to, to, to look at um, the constraints inherent in the material and their impact on the urban form itself. So one quick, uh, example, for instance, in the Catalan vault, uh, where you know the Catalan vault is essentially a laminated system where we have small tiles that that are are layered one on, on top of the other. Um, it would be interesting to sort of see whether your double curved geometry right now uh, is associated perhaps with the size of a tile. Maybe that size of a tile has uh, some relationship to the brittleness of the concrete or or some the material properties of the concrete. Um, and, and this is in a way not to unravel your project at this stage because it's not that's not the ambition, but it's basically to justify or to explain how those links are manifested themselves in 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 the project. Um, I think it's also interesting when 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 um, you look at the um, the building systems that you are proposing, uh, clearly there's a there's a scalar relationship between the spans that have to be achieved, the, the density of the structure. They, they all link back to a domestic architecture, which basically has limited spans. But um, you'd be helpful to understand, um, you know, even at this level, you know, is there an ambition to maybe um, be judicious about your material use and to sort of say, you know, you've tested. The, these spans and they have an impact into the slab, uh, the slab depth or the wall depth. Um, you know, it would be interesting to sort of talk about uh, is there a relationship between the thermal mass that's being proposed here? Is there the thickness of the walls and there's a thermal inertia that occurs because of because of those dimensions, and maybe also uh, perhaps um, it would be interesting to sort of see how some other environmental considerations are incorporated here. So for instance, the use of the double roof, which is, which is very, very important. So uh, uh, this, this idea that in, a, in addition to the thermal mass, we have another layer of, of kind of uh, protection. Um, and, and, and in a way, I think that that kind of l creates this kind of arc between the innovation at the material level and then the formal uh, you know, this kind of macro scale formal consequence uh, of that. But I very much enjoy the project, I, th I think to this level, and it's, it's, it's great to see the richness that's associated uh, with, with that. Thank you very much. Um, I mean, I was impressed with the amount of work and also the quality. I mean, it's, uh, 
unbelievable what you managed to do in a whatever short period of time and with these conditions as well. All that testing, it's impressive. Uh, as others said, it's a topic that is very relevant. Uh, as you know, I mean, almost every office in London is working on a project in the Middle East or has worked on various projects in the Middle East the last 10 years, and we still do. Um, and all these areas you, 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 anal you, know, we just, you worked on are still relevant, and we still try to figure out you know, what is the best solution to the problems that the region has. Um, I have a couple of questions. Uh, one is the material studies. Um, have you explored, you said you did a lot of experiments that you didn't discuss here and failed. Uh, have you uh, experimented with um, geopolymers and also uh, try and eliminate concrete from the equation um, and perhaps you know, use less water? Because the water is a precious resource. Um, so if there is a technique that uh, is using less water or no water, to cure, um, it's always a good idea. So I would like to hear your views there. Um, and the other things is on, on of course, the, the building massing you have uh, presented here is excellent. I do like the variety you have on heights because at the beginning when you start presenting it with all these clusters, I, my fear was that you will have all, you know, same height buildings and very dense. And what you have here is impressive because you have managed to change the height of the buildings, creating whatever the vaults to catch uh, the breeze and hopefully deflect down. What is not very clear is how you are using these vaults and, and, and these high elements. Are they used to deflect the wind down, which is something that is quite beneficial in that part of the world? Um, uh, the facade is very interesting because you have explored the principles of uh, self-shading, small openings, you know, um, perhaps some spaces behind the openings that are open, like balconies. But I do see in this picture, for example, that all of them, you have three orientations and all of them, they have similar response. And I do expect a similar response on east and west, but on the south or north, I'm not sure what I'm looking at here. I still see these vertical openings and I'm, I'm asking um, why all look the same in terms of facade treatment. Uh, and there's not any orientation, let's say, differences. Um, what else? I mean, it's uh, I mean, just minor things, really. I mean, there, you know, the, the majority of the presentation is excellent. But if you can help me understand this kind of the questions yeah. that I have raised. Um, so for the first part, um, you asked a question about the materiality and yeah. geopolymers. We did test some, um, but the geopolymers resulted in something that was I'd, maybe it was something that we did. And it was a test that we did that weren't efficient enough in a way. But the geopolymers, the material itself, once it had cured, let's say after a week or a couple of days, it was still quite, for a lack of a better word, squishy. Um, it hadn't hardened enough. And I don't think that it would be able to offer the same structural support that unfortunately we would we had to go with, let's say, a concrete composite. But I don't think that it was allowing us to have the same structural stability. Um, another material that we did really um, uh, think would uh, perform well uh, in, in terms of structure was um, an admixture of clay, desert sand, um, and another material, and Poly that lactate. Po poly polyvinyl acetate. Mm -hmm. um, but the problem with that was that um, the polyvinyl acetate is not a very uh, environmentally friendly material. The drying times of that also were quite elongated, and um, we found that it was quite brittle, and we didn't really have time to test any um, you know, things that would probably improve the tensile strength. Um, if we had more time, I think then, let's say for our Catalan vaulting system, we would probably adapt those brick tiles or clay tiles as opposed to having concrete um, blocks. Um, for your second question. Um, the facade strategy, we were positioning east and west according to the aggregation of panels, but we were also considering the programmatic point of view. So like, um, some parts that you require bedroom and daylight ex exposure, like we have like bigger openings, even if it's, if it's north and south facing. So we created this catalog, but like it can be improved and like have like more complexity within the panels and how it aggregates and how it relates to environmental conditions such as north, south, east and west. Also, Facing. another thing, sorry to add on to Maria's um, explanation for the architecture was that um, our, our cluster is broken up into 20, by 20 meters by 20 meters, let's say cubes in a way. 
And um, as you can see, let's say in a different render, um, go next. Um, so for example, at this point on the left-hand side, you can see that um, this is a, a public, public it's, it's a public space, it's a public courtyard, but um, these modules on the left, they all have solid walls, either due to radiation or due to the fact that they have another window on the other side. But in some situations where, um, let's say, the, uh, the, the second floor module is positioned within the middle of, um, of the 20 by 20 block, we may need, uh, we probably had to have, you know, windows on both sides to allow for enough light to penetrate, or there might have been a solid wall on the other side. So there were sort of some limitations in um, relating to the facade system. But yes, this would probably be de more developed if we did have more time. And um, the last thing I think you said was um, the environmental factors. Um, so some of the facade treatments, for example, if we have, uh, and the, the shell itself, um, we've given a lot of height to the living spaces. So for the um, living room, for the dining room, we've given a lot of height so that during the day, um, the hot air rises and you don't really need to have any cooling effect. And then in the other spaces, you know, you let's say in the bedrooms, if you have a 12 meter module above, you're sort of shaded or you, you sort of don't have the, the same amount of direct radiation within your internal space. And um, this is how we thought, thought it through. And there is a lot of room for improvement as with, you know, anything. Um, but yes, this is what we've achieved so far. No, but it's very good. I mean, I one of my first uh, projects when I joined forces was working on the master um, eco city right. in Abu Dhabi. Yes. And uh, the first phase was built and I was lucky enough to go back and measure um, mm. all these things that we thought we will achieve, which is, you know, maximize the passive design opportunities as much as you can. So you minimize the need for cooling. Yes. So what we did there, you know, we used a lot of, you know, similar approach, really, you know, so, you know, self shading facades, uh, small windows, buffer zones. Um, and what we measured is what, what we went there in July and we switched off all the air conditioning you know, for a week before, you know, to make sure that we measure the temperature outside, you know, in the desert, in the courtyards we created, in the narrow streets, and then eventually we went into the, the accommodations. And then we measure that the temperature only increased by four degrees. I mean, you know, comfort, you say, is like 26 mm -hmm. degrees, 24. And then we reach, let's say, 28 degrees in peak July when outside was 42, 45. Yes. And all had to do with the way you articulate the facades, you minimize the solar gain. Mm -hmm. And also what we learned, and I thought it was interesting, you separate, you know, the window, as we know it is, you know, sometimes it's used for views out and bring daylight in, but also used for ventilation. Mm -hmm. in, in that part of the world, if you separate the two functions, the, the views out and the light from the ventilation, it yes. could offer you some benefits because what you need there, mm -hmm. you need effective ventilation, especially at night, in a way it's safe, it's dust proof. So you should articulate the ventilation openings um, at the lower levels or higher levels, you know, almost in every box or every unit you have. Yeah. And, and you use your window wherever it's appropriate and you deal with privacy and, you know, and, and you know, the quality of light you would like to achieve inside. But if you separate the two, it gives you more opportunity mm -hmm. uh, for the climate just to have it there, you know, purging at night in a very safe way without distract, you know, the occupants in every room, you know, mm -hmm. bedrooms. Using the height is an excellent idea. I think we were pushing for extra height in the accommodations. But as you know, you know, sometimes you argue with developers because there is extra cost when you have extra height. Mm -hmm. But we felt that if we had another meter, <laughs> you know, extra, you know, a higher level in every room, we will have, you know, made the situation even better in terms of uh, passive design and comfort. You know, almost no need for cooling uh, for 90% of the year, just for having more volume mm -hmm. for the air warmer to rise and and, and not being the occupant, uh, let's say, area. Uh, I wouldn't exclude the geopolymers uh, totally. I know that you've done some experiments, but there is a lot of work out there. Yes. Uh, and there are companies, and there's one in Australia that is using geopolymer mixes to do tunnels and, uh, and infrastructure work. So um, okay. they have achieved good strength, and they have done airports and tarmacs, and you name it. So. Uh, a lot of people are using, looking at geopolymers, also in the UK, and you can see they want to replace, you know, uh, they want to use geopolymers for uh, roads mm -hmm. and, and highways. Uh, and if you Google that, you will find the article. A BRE is doing a lot of work to uh, understand what are the various mixes and what you can use where. Um, uh, if the requirements for your concrete blocks shouldn't be the same. For example, you have different strength requirements for the foundations. Yeah. Perhaps you should go back into more conventional mixes, not that they're more robust. 
And then the more you go up and, you know, you, you, you go away from the primary structure, you have secondary or, you know, certain decorative details, there you can just be a little bit more ambitious with your, you know, the mixes, you know, they, they need to just support their own weight, really, you know, they're not critical. And there you can actually use components that they use less water. Mm -hmm. Going back to the mix that somehow, yes, yeah, it's a bit more brittle, but actually, you know, it doesn't actually do a lot. It's just like a porous brick, really, that, you know, it's supposed mm -hmm. to aid ventilation. So if you can, exp I mean, and you have a couple of days, if you can just think if there's any opportunity, run and they all look the same and you use exactly the same block from zero to, I don't know how many. If you can articulate the, the buildings in a way that you use different types of blocks and these different types of blocks, they use different amount of water. And of course, they achieve different strength, but that's okay. Because yes. you don't need the same strength everywhere. Um, that would be perhaps mm -hmm. useful. Thank you so much for your comments. Oh, I appreciate it. Thank you very much for presenting this to us. I uh, just wanted to add one one very small thing. It just um, and this is again, it's it's for future, not for now. Obviously, it's, it goes beyond the the scope of of, of two weeks. Um, you know, you, you you have the design for the wall, which has this kind of wavy um, uh, geometry, and it, it reminded me of uh, there's the work of uh, Paul Shepard at Bath, which basically looks at. Um, um, I mean, I'm I'm going to post a paper that he put in on the design of of, of non prismatic concrete beams, which basically sort of talks about, you know, using concrete in the areas that matter and eliminating it from the areas that don't, that don't matter. And it strikes me your geometry for the wall is actually probably equally, if not more appropriate for the, for the slab, you know, because it, in, in a way it, it, it actually reduces the material, material wood uh, and, and can allow you to achieve um, perhaps even even bigger spans anyway have have a look it's not not for now just maybe something that can trigger further research thank you so much we'll look into that thank you and also another element before i forget it's it's uh, yeah. what we learn also in that part of the world is prefabrication is great yes but actually the majority of the effort um goes into the foundations yes um, and there you, it's very difficult i mean if there is any i mean perhaps for a future project not yours because you don't have enough time is how do you prepare the ground mm -hmm. for the prefabricated elements to go up? Because they do need a smooth, <laughs> flat platform. So yeah. then, you know, you, you have uh, this um, uh, standardization also that you can achieve, you know, what you have here. The foundation is always uh, the problematic area. This is where you use a lot of labor, you mm -hmm. know, untrained labor. And all the environmental impact really is there, you know, the negative one. Yes. You know, cut and fill, you know, how do you prepare the ground, all that and all that. It's it's an area that I think is someone needs to tackle in the future. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Great. So the last but not the least. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so, hello everyone. We are Felipe, Yongin, and Devaya. Our thesis works around the water scarcity, desertification, and displacement problems currently going on in East Africa, proposing new settlement and architectural strategies to tackle those problems. Eastern Africa is home to one of the biggest population of pastoral nomads in the world, where climate change is affecting them and forcing them to live in refugee camps. We believe a settlement strategy that could provide shelter, water, and fodder would enable the pastoral nomad survival and tackle displacement problems in the Horn of Africa. So we will go through the introduction, the domain research question, hypothesis, strategy, design development, and finally the design proposal. Our research focused on the Somali region of Ethiopia, home to the highest number of IDPs due to climate causes. The region has low water availability and the second highest food insecurity index in the country. Nevertheless, it has high winds and altitudes that could make fog water harvesting possible. We decided to concentrate on the Hara region as it is, it is home to one of the biggest refugee camps in the world. Our proposed site lies 30 kilometers south of Kabibeya camp, currently housing 15,000 um, Somali refugees with a rural pastoral background, as we think they can be a potential population to be gradually relocated to a proposed settlement. Moreover, the chosen site is in the middle of the main road, which is a major trading and grazing route for pastoralists in the region. According to our previous research, pastoral activities can result in three different types of settlement, uh, according to their mobility, combining housing with animal breeding and agriculture in different ways. 
However, climate change is turning the lands that these groups inhabit into deserts. The livestock is dying due to lack of water and they end up having to settle in refugee camps. The human water consumption in the region is around 15 liters a day, which is mainly used to cover drinking, cooking, and basic hygiene necessities for survival. 42% of that water is being collected from untreated wells or springs. The selected site presents four different climatic seasons with only two rainy seasons going from mid-March to mid-June and mid-September to mid-November, affecting agriculture and feed availability during the rest of the year. We estimated the pastoralist population that could benefit from our settlement by drawing a 10 kilometer radius from our site. According to our estimations, around 3,200 pastoral nomads could be visiting the settlement during the dry season. In order to define our agricultural potential, we evaluated the water use, potential harvest, and animal fed per hectare for different crops and fodder, all of which are drought resistant and growing in proximity to our site. We also studied indigenous agricultural strategies of Africa, which focus on soil and water conservation, of which the side pits and birkas are exploded further. As a president, we studied the Waka Tower, which was designed to harvest water from fog and air humidity in the coastal region of Ethiopia, and adapted it to our material and site conditions through a set of multi-objective optimization experiments to maximize water harvesting and structural performance. This leads us to our research question. Can a resilient design strategy be developed towards creating self-sufficient rural settlements in Ethiopia's rural region, capable of harvesting fog and rainwater and managing its resources to respond to pastoral seasonal movement? Our hypothesis being that water harvesting and indigenous irrigation practices can help find malnutrition and diseases caused by water shortage. Access to clean water and food could reduce the number of displaced people and conflicts over resources, establishing rural settlements which can temporarily house displaced people while managing the surrounding natural resources could have a positive impact against deforestation and desertification. And finally, the combination of deployable formwork and bioshock fit technologies could enable a fabrication system capable of transitioning from quick assembly to temporary structures to permanent ones. For our design strategy, we looked at two scales. The architectural scale investigates the cluster level. Each cluster is comprised of four to five water harvesting towers. Each tower is shared between four housing units with common wash facilities and communal spaces. Distribution of multiple such clusters is planned in relation to hydrology, agriculture, and population density. This aggregation strategy results in up to 2,000 housing units and 500 towers to support a population of up to 12,000 people at an urban scale. The UN Hetsi Handbook for for emergency suggests a hierarchy of scales for planning. Based on this, the proposed settlement is divided into a settlement cluster, which comprises of 16 to 20 housing units. 16 such clusters make up a settlement block. Four such blocks make up a settlement sector and two such sectors make up the settlement. To propose a construction strategy, we studied the local materials available, which are currently being used for construction in the region. Our studies show earth, wood, and grass to be the most used materials. The graph indicates the feasibility of the distinct types of materials available in each of these categories and their potential for use in construction. The construction sequence for the proposed shelters requires the ability to transform from a temporary to a permanent structure. Therefore, we propose the use of deployable structures which allow a certain flexibility we think is necessary for our project. By adding a membrane on top, they can act as emergency shelters for the seasonal nomads and refugees. The permanent settlers can convert their temporary shelter into permanent shell structures by shortcutting earth onto the membrane. If the refugees return to their hometowns after a brief period, the deployable structures can be dismantled, reused, or adapted accordingly. Additionally, we investigated manual and robotic spraying technologies, which were further studied and compared in a set of material experiments. The proposed site has sand loamy sandy soil, which is made up of 10 to 15 percent of clay. However, the site is located only three kilometers away from the clay plains, which are formed by the seasonal rivers. The latest research indicates separating dry and wet matter proved to be the most effective process. Therefore, we propose three phases of spraying, which are liquid, dry, and viscous. This is a general overview of the experiments that were conducted in the design development process. We will take you through the site analysis, settlement distribution, and agriculture patterns to show their influence in the block planning experiments, tower and how tower and housing unit form finding and design experiments were conducted in parallel, which also informed the block planning experiments and result in the final design proposal. Material experiments for deployable structures and bioshock creating were conducted to inform the final proposal. We started our experiments for site analysis with topography, slope, and hydrology, generating relevant ter terrain information, which informed the site selection and settlement distribution experiments. 
The settlement planning experiment was focused on identifying a study patch of 25 square kilometers. So we conducted a GA to select a suitable patch which aims to minimize the area of dry land, distance from the highway, overall slope, and to maximize the catchment area. Of the multiple solutions which were generated, we selected the solution showing a balanced result across all the objectives. Having identified the study patch, a settlement distribution algorithm was set up, generating numerous distribution patterns anchored around the water channels, catchment ponds, and agriculture lands. After running the GA from the multiple results, we again decided to go with a solution which showed a more balanced improvement across all the objectives. The chosen result was then subdivided into 30 meters by 30 meter grids to start the block planning experiments. We identified two blocks which are in proximity to the highway. For the definition of the land distribution, we further subdivided the grids into 16 by 16 meter plots and picked the plots closest to the water channels and ponds for agriculture. Fodder areas were located around the blocks in semi-moist areas with livestock husbandry land being generated in proximity to them. Out of the remaining land, we picked the highest plot to place the first tower and selected 19 closest plots to it. These plots were divided into lowest to be used for agriculture and highest to be used for housing. This process is repeated with the following towers until the number of towers needed is achieved. This algorithm guarantees a set distance between the towers and an average height for their placement, which allows for fog water collection. Having identified agricultural patches, they are categorized into dry and wet for the purpose of Zypit development. Wet patches being located close to the water channels or ponds and dry patches being located away from them. The dry patches have larger and deeper pits and the wet patches have smaller pits. With this classification, we were able to calculate the number of pits and the quantity of produce potentially available for every crop site. Furthermore, Zy pits are effective for a total of three years from their development to their final crop harvest before the pits fill up and need to be redeveloped, in which time TEF, a short cycle crop, and sorghum, a long cycle crop, can be cultivated twice. Therefore, we looked at a strategy of patch rotation wherein all available agriculture land is divided into, th in, divided into three patches wherein each patch is cultivated at different years in order to ensure continuous supply of produce. The timeline indicates the process of patch rotation, where we can see two years of increased agricultural production and two years of lean agricultural production. During the lean period, labor is focused on building construction and the settlement growth. For the further subdivision of the land around the towers, we picked the four highest plots to be used for permanent housing. After that, the 12 towers in each block closest to the livestock area are selected to accommodate the nomad housing in the dry season, after which shower and toilet areas are defined. Once the block is completed, public land is added between it and the road, and the inner network is generated by connecting the average points in each cluster. Finally, the public programs are placed around that network. The final outcome of the setup was a zoning plan intertwining agriculture, housing, and livestock husbandry. The following workflow shows the changing parameters with which we aim to achieve the best shape possible in each different weather scenario. The two main aspects to be considered when designing a water harvesting towers are functions and form, uh, which we're trying to optimize through the multi-objective optimization pro uh, experiments. To set an initial form finding process, uh, we started by sorting out from the existing worker tower and classify this tower into three body parts to maximize water harvesting performance with adaptive uh, structure according to the changing seasonal patterns. And after running a genetic algorithm experiments, we reached the design for a nine meter high tower with a water tank capacity of 5,000 liter. And the tower subdivision is rings makes the assembly easy to carry by the hands. And once the elements are assembled, they need to be attached to the stabilizing cables. And we are expecting the towers to be performed for not only collecting the water, but also providing a semi-public space for the residents. For our housing design, we conducted a series of form finding experiments during the MSC phase, exploring the relationship between form and structural performance. We also explored the relationship between units, evaluating the environmental performance of the building. This resulted in a modular typology made out of a variable number of small scale structures working only under compression. An open triangular base space is used for rainwater flow collection on which houses are attached by the central social space of the house. Attached to these are quadrangular spaces used for sleeping and other activities, the number depending on the household size. You can see here uh, how the modular approach can respond to different household sizes. Our temporary house is constructed through a variable number of equal modular light structures. These connect to the permanent water collection modules during the dry season. 
the number of modules will depend on the amount of people needing temporary accommodation. The house plan of the permanent house clearly distinguishes between social and private spaces, whereas the temporary house being constructed by one type of module allows for the space to be configured and used in a more flexible way. If the temporary inhabitant wants to settle permanently, one of the modules is shot created and becomes the central social space of a new house. Here we can see the yearly development of a housing unit doing agriculture during the wet season and accommodating pastoral nomads during the dry season. This allows for integration and trade between permanent and temporary settlers. As we introduce this process of the construction cycle for the transition from temporary dwellings to permanent housing, we plan to fabricate an actual deployable arch and material experiments to calibrate our computational process. So we took one of the arches and fabricated one to two scale model to see its feasibility of the deployable structure. And the lower bands were used to connect each pore and we were able to build an actual model. So in order to implement actual deployability, it is necessary to apply the joints mechanisms over for each node to make the arch self-standing and connects to the membrane layers on top of the structure. So there are several steps to achieve the shared structure. Uh, this material experiment aims to test material mixtures and spring parameters required for the different layers and to help to calibrate the tool for the photo robotic spring experiment. The setup for this experiment uses a spray gun connected to an air compressor. And the uh, spray gun has four nozzle sizes, which were tested at a different range of air pressures. The tests were, uh, were conducted indoors. Um, our first manual spray conducted in different spray conditions shows us some parameters to show how further springs. Uh, uh, for further springs. It was necessary to reduce the gap between those two diameters due to the low viscosity of the material mixture. And throughout the several spring, uh, we got the best result in terms of uh, area coverage and material reposition from the six and eight millimeter nodules at three to five bar pressure. To test these parameters on our housing modules, we abstracted two panels, and those panels were CNC'd in hard form to behave as a formwork uh, to uh, place the jute to spray on. Uh, through the experiments, uh, we've observed that a two to one to one mixture shows a better result with suitable viscosity for smooth spraying. And five bar air pressure with eight millimeter nozzle size were suitable condition to spray the material evenly on the surface. And the amount of the mixture that passed behind the jute was also significantly reduced. The next step was to test dry material as a reinforcement layer on top of the spray clay. Uh, we consider that straw and rice husks are the most uh, feasible materials to apply with the clay mixture due to the material availability on site and fast dry time. The outcomes led us to believe that penalization could be a good strategy for the construction in order to increase the shear thickness, helping in the addition to the fibers and some layers while reducing the construction time. And then we attached the spray gun to the robotic arm to conduct a robotic spraying experiment according to four different tool passes. The video shows some drawbacks in terms of misreading spring and the material waste uh, due to the wrong placement of the target panel and the material's low viscosity. Once the automated process is completed, it is hard to control and adjust the problem directly. A process combining human labor with robotic tools would ideally be the best fabrication process considering the need of the nomadic community and the requirements of the material system. Our robotic spring experiment indicates that the process can be automated. However, the technology uh, still requires further testing and the final outcome of the manual spring in our experiments showed no big difference uh, with robotic spring. Uh, the fabric, uh, fabrication sequence of the houses start with the foundational filling, followed by the deployable arches. Once the uh, dwellings are formed, further spraying of the shell is conducted to enhance the towards the uh, permanent structures, and people can remove the arches and recycle them for further application. 
The cluster scale is defined by a group of four towers, each one potentially collecting water for either four permanent houses or three permanent and three temporary houses visiting the settlement uh, three months a year. And this is enhanced by the water collection spaces, collecting water, uh, rainwater for up to two houses. Uh, this view shows a subcluster comprising of one tower and one tower and permanent housing during the short dry season. This is a view showing the cluster comprising of four towers, temporary nomad housing, and permanent housing at the end of the short rainy season. So revisiting the research question, we believe the combination of deployable formwork and bioshorty technologies enables a fabrication system capable of transitioning from quick assembly temporary structures to more permanent ones, thereby providing rehab rehabilitation to displaced people and refugees, whilst also providing temporary housing to pastoral nomads. Water harvesting and indigenous agriculture techniques allow for management of natural resources to provide for the stakeholders of the settlement all year round, creating a resili resilient settlement which has a positive impact on its surrounding natural resources. The growth of the settlement is dependent on meeting the agriculture and water requirements. Based on our agricultural strategy and timeline, we have two years of lean agricultural production and two years of maximized agricultural production. During the lean period, labor is focused on settlement growth with up to 1,200 people being accommodated each year. Therefore, we estimate that the settlement would take up to 14 years to reach a population of 9,600 people. Climatic emergencies and refugee crisis are unplanned and drastic making it challenging to provide a solution that addresses all the concerns involved. Nevertheless, we believe that building resilient communities can help local inhabitants to deal with the climatic crisis without having to be displaced and generating a positive impact on the environment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great. You're going to keep this screen on. Okay. Maybe I start for sure. Um, short question, maybe that I will, can think of more later. Um, but um, I think it's a very interesting project. So thank you. It's also a really nice presentation, very detailed and um, thoroughly presented. Um, but where you kind of lost me is um, when you show the assembly sequence and fabrication process of your shell structures. Um, so what I really did not understand is what's the benefit of having a robotically sprayed concrete. I mean, I don't think that this fits very well in the context where you situate yourself. And I also don't understand what's the benefit. Yeah, we, we wanted to initially to compare whether uh, some sort of automat automation was possible uh, within the construction project. Uh, to reduce the construction times due to the crisis and the time in which you need to construct the houses. And that's why we looked into robotics. Uh, but from, from the experiments we made, the final outcome was not that different between one and the other. Uh, even for, for the construction time, uh, it took for one manual panel and a robotic uh, panel to be manufactured with all the the previous arrangements we had to that. I mean, this is this I understand. I think I mean it's a it's a super relevant topic. Um, the automa automatization of um, construction processes, etc. I mean, it's um, here in Stuttgart we do a lot of research in this topic. But um, I mean, what what I was questioning is this. Um, Your whole process is manual and pretty labor intense. And then the last bit is spraying the concrete on top of it. I would say this is not the challenge of this, of constructing these elements. And I also think, I mean, um, 
The idea of turning this um, temporary structures in permanent structures, I found convincing, but your um, planning process, I think for this water tower, I think there you, they are developed really nicely. I mean, you, you explained why they look like, how, how they look, they are segmented that people can carry them um, by hand and then assemble it on top of each other and um, reinforcing them with the scopes. Um, this makes sense, but this um, whole form finding algorithm and optimization process for the vault structures, I have doubts if this is in the, this context the correct answer. Also, a lot of this um, traditional um, molecular structures um, across the world are, are basically um, building shell like structures out of bent elements because this is so easy and intuitive to build with not much knowledge. And it's also um, relatively adaptive to tolerance issues. While this scissor like um, structures you propose, I mean, they're extremely highly complex and not forgiving at all to any tolerance issues. So this is, um, I mean, I don't want to, <laughs> I mean, it's critique on a very high level, right? But it's like, um, your outcome still looks very much like this traditional vernacular structures, but you replace all the smartness of this um, intuitive adaptive building materials they are usually made of um, mm -hmm. mechanically high complex systems. Yeah, like the, the, the idea to why we chose the CISO mechanism was mainly because <laughs> the length of the elements needed for the bend uh, structure are longer. Uh, so we wanted to use a, a structure that could use shorter elements due to the low uh, wood available in the region. But now do you need less wood? Uh, it's, it's, we, we need shorter elements, which we can get from... But you could bundle short elements. Yes. I, I wonder... Um, I... I, I um... I agree with Axel. I think your your, your presentation is, is great and, and it's really there there are elements that I, I really, really enjoyed uh in the presentation. There there's um the using the GA for the site selection. I've never seen that done before and I thought that was really fantastic. That was great. Uh and and I agree the the about the construction methodology diagrams for the for the tower. Um I, one thing for the tower, I, I, it, it was a bit, um, I, I wasn't quite sure which elements were in tension and which were in compression. And, and also how you would actually make the net itself. What, like, what's the process? How would actually someone actually, actually sort of put that, put that together? That could, could do with it just a little bit more, more, um, more detail for me. I, I, I agree with Axel completely on the robotic um, nature of the, of the, you know the, the problems with the robot, and and I wonder, um, this isn't to do away with with a robot altogether because I I think the other element that is maybe a bit a bit difficult to to um, to imagine being resilient under these circumstances is the deployable uh, wood structure. You know you'd imagine that breaking really easily. It's very it looks fragile. Um, I wonder if there's perhaps another way to kind of conceive of the shell. Uh, you know, one can imagine the robot actually being there. You know, you could you can imagine at a government level there's a there's a there's a deployable robot. It goes in and seeds these kind of uh, developments as they as they occur. So that that can that can work. But what if we rethink the role of the robot. So in other words, you are setting up this um, uh, repeatable uh, shell. Uh, and it's at the moment, the shell is contingent on the deployable structure. But what if we imagine the shell in the context of a shell on a mold? You know, at, 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 it's essentially build it, build it up on top of a structure that exists and perhaps it's robotically fabricated in order to inscribe it with the precision of uh, efficiency, perhaps grooves are pre um, 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 sort of uh, drilled in the, in, in the structure. That we can imagine that being robotically fabricated and then, f and, and it's a highly um, uh, systematized uh, process of work. But on top of that, uh, one can imagine a very efficient 
a manual labor process where simply those layers are just draped on top, they cure, they're lifted up and moved away. You know, and that's a very, very, it's a low skilled labor, very efficient. The robot by this point is way, you know, long gone. It's in a, it's seeding another development somewhere else uh, and using th those resources efficiently and, and moving away from this kind of sort of very fragile uh, kind of uh, el elements that are, you know, look like they're kind of, as you know, as again, as Axel said, you know, they, they can, they, 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 um, they're so contingent on getting everything right and, and the tolerances to match and, uh, and everything else. But having said that, ev everything else, I think uh, it's really, really well, well uh, presented and, 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 and kind of really interesting project. Yeah, I agree with everyone. Uh, it's an interesting project, but when I read the title, I thought that I will see robots carrying the water around and helping with um, agriculture needs first, and then perhaps repurposed to help you, you know, construct these elements that you would like to use temporarily as shelter and then eventually as habitations and everything, you know, like somehow I feel the priorities are a bit mixed. You know, if this is a waterscape agriculture project in that remote location, uh, if you want to use technology, you know, you should use it where the, there is a need every day. And I think there is a need every day in the agriculture world where you have to do something every day and it's quite onerous. The building work is one off. You'll do it and then what is going to happen with the robot or whatever, you know, you want to use, you know, it's going to rot there, you no? Know, because your building needs are not that, it's, 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 it's not frequent. And it takes a long period of time, you know, maybe you will use it for the first vault and then it's going to stay, you know, inert for two years until you have growing needs and then you need to use for another vault. By that time, it will be a technology perhaps obsolete. So somehow it doesn't flow for me, you know, the thing, why robots? And I was hoping that, you know, if there are, if there are anything that the robots can do uh, to help them. So that's one uh, observation. The other thing is why concrete? You know, I mean, in, in that part, you know, like why spray concrete is not the best material to use oh, in a rural not, environment. I mean, I do understand spraying, the benefits, but... Uh, we're not spraying concrete. Uh, maybe, oh, sorry. Uh, I thought it was it concrete. It was not clear, but we, we are spraying a mixture of clay and sand uh, with fibers. Okay, I apologize. And I thought it was concrete from the color. But the experiments you did was with concrete or with clay? No, no, with, with clay. Oh, everything with clay. Okay, yeah, so then yeah, that's yeah. fine. Okay, I thought it was concrete. I apologize there. No, I mean, it's, it's, that's the only thing. It's just the, you know, the use of robots, you know, it was not necessary. And you said it as well in your presentation. We tested mm -hmm. it and it didn't make a huge difference. Um, so um, then is that shape, the vault, the, the most forgiving one in terms of intolerances and imperfections? Discuss. Um, I do believe if you could use as formwork also the waste from the agriculture, you know, you do have seasonal waste, you know, when you do all these things, you know, there is land that you might want to push around, there are crops that, you know, somehow you want to store somewhere for other uses of, of compost. There is so much waste around when you cultivate the land. Uh, also the water, it can be stored in banks and used as, as formwork, you know, so somehow there's so many things you have available around you uh, to use a formwork maybe suitable and to help you with the construction rather than um, rely on this whatever delicate system, let's say, that you presented. Mm -hmm. But the rest is, I mean, the topic is relevant. I mean, everything, it's, it was very nicely presented. I really enjoyed as well the site selection. And I think it was very nicely done. Thank you. <clears throat> one, one last, uh, just for me, I, I wanted to mention it before, but uh, Irene triggered it again as memory. It, it, what, what would be also helpful to, to see what, what happens at the end of the design life of, of, of each mm -hmm. hut, you know, can you break it? What happens to the, you know, waste concrete or sorry, clay with a waste clay? Can that be recovered for, for, for a different use or, or, uh, you know, Put put forward for maybe an infrastructural purpose or something to do to, with the support of of the uh, agriculture or, or the irrigation associated uh, with that. Would you like to answer that, guys? Or yeah, we 
like we don't have a, an actual answer for that the, something the, to think about yeah we we, <clears throat> we hypothesize with what would happen to the settlement if refugees leave uh, mm -hmm. and the idea of using clay was also uh, for that to be able to sort of dismantle these structures and mix them with the with the ground um, in, in the case the settlement ceases to exist mm -hmm. uh, to lower the impact uh, on, on that but yeah we don't have a, a, a real answer mm -hmm. That's, that's okay. I mean, these are all important points to, to think about for the final submission. I mean, just for the jury members, you know, we've had a lot of conversations on the use of robotic fabrication, so it's definitely something to, to think about, to reflect on for the final, for the final document. Um, thank you, guys. Thank you. Any thank other you. questions or comments? Mike, anything that you would like to add, perhaps? <laughs> uh, well, yes, about all the presentations. And um, firstly, I'd like to thank our uh, invited critics. Um, we've had very good questions today. And I think for uh, the students, well done for your presentations. They are hugely improved from the last time I saw them. And I think everyone, all the jurors commented uh, their questions come because you're coherent and organized. And so uh, and that shows up important things in the work. Yeah. Questions I thought were really excellent today and you have two weeks to address them. Yeah. And the temptation you will have is to say, um, well, we, we did a good job and maybe those are relevant questions, but actually they were really sharp. Yeah. So some of you, that's going to suggest uh, a little bit of resequencing your document. Bring those questions not till the very end and say, well, the jury has asked this and we answer that. But try and embed the answer to those questions throughout the document. Yeah. And, and uh, th there's no harm at all in uh, showing failed experiments. And I think... So. Uh, some of the students today showed that really well. I think with a robotics question on the last one, mm. it's fine if you test it and it doesn't show any advantage. You need to say that. You, you did say it and you need to reposition your work accordingly. Mm. Um, there's nothing wrong with doing, doing experiments that don't work. It's, I'm sure our jurors will, will know that quite a lot of the work that goes on in a profession, you try something, it doesn't work, and you, they learn very quick to move on very quickly from, from things that don't work, but to use them to inform it. Um, so uh, one, one final thing to all the students, uh, I think you've been great. I think mm. you've been in a really difficult, and I know some of you have had uh, COVID and you've had difficulties where you live and so forth. So I think you've done a great job. And it's just, you know, the thing I always say, the, how you finish is really important. And so these last two weeks are really crucial for you. Um, and the most intelligent use of those two weeks is, is to answer the questions from today. I think Elif and Milad will make the recording available to you so you can go back and check and, yes. and really make sure you do do it. Yeah, um, we've we've also noted all the questions. Uh, we yeah, we can have a recap session if yeah, you guys we'll like in you the guys, next two yeah. weeks. Yeah, yeah. We'll meet with you okay. guys. And but we'll, I, let's hope finally one day for a jurors and all for the students that we can meet on the terrace. Here in hopefully. Berkeley. Hopefully sometime this year, yeah. <laughs> Fingers crossed. I I also like to thank all the jury members um, for your really valuable comments, really spot on questions today, and and to the students for all their hard work during this time, for all the dedication. And yeah, like Milad said, we'll be meeting you guys before your submission to go over these questions and to you know think about how you can address them in the final document. And uh, then you submit, and yeah. We'll come together at some point during the year, hopefully, to celebrate. <laughs> okay, well. Um, yeah. In two weeks' time, you all go back to being a person. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You may face some philosophical question now. What yeah, now? Exactly. What's next? <laughs> what am I doing now? Yeah. yeah. <laughs>
cool. So um, we'll see you guys at 2.30 for Mike Cook's le lecture. And um, until then, get some rest, you know. Uh, yeah, we'll see you soon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. 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 Thank you.